A person who shall rename eternal, remain eternally nameless this morning poured a cup of coffee on my laptop. The person was me. Um, and so I don't have cool slides for you. So, you know, you're missing out on memes, but mostly I'm going to just talk to you. So it'll be all right. If you really want to see the memes, send me an email and I'll, I'll show you the memes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so about 5,000 years ago in a place called Katal Hoyuk in Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey, some people got really, really bored and they started carving pig knuckle bones and rocks into dice and they made a game out of it. And those are some of the earliest known game pieces ever. And ever since, people have been playing games, right? It's been kind of a thing. It's been a thing for rich people. And then like by Roman times, it was kind of a thing for everybody. And then by about a thousand years after Roman times, it was only a thing for rich people again. And then you sort of fast forward from there and you end up in about the 1800s where the most wonderful people Okay, they were mostly pretty bad people, but they did some cool stuff. The Victorians lived, and they were like, what if instead of making games that you can only play if you spend all your time figuring out how to play games, we made games that anyone could play? And that's when you start getting modern board games, right? So you start getting really weird games, like the game of suffrage which is an elaborate game from the late 1800s about women's suffrage. It was made by suffragettes to get people to play games and in playing games learn something. That's where you start to see, like for me that's the point where we transition to what we call modern board games, where people are using themes that are immediately and directly relevant to other people's lives in games. So that's how then as we transition into the late 1800s, the Prussians come along, and the Prussians are really good at one thing, which is shooting other people, and they want to be good at it all the time. So the Prussians invent war games. They invent the idea that we can get two people together on either side of a table, we can give them lots of little toy soldiers, and we can teach them how to fight wars by having them move those soldiers around, and then we have another person who's like a referee. And if that sounds anything to you like a role-playing game, like those people are maybe, they should just put some dragons in that and it would be way cooler, you're right. <laughs> because directly from that lineage you get Dungeons and Dragons, right? A hundred years later in the 1970s. Directly from that lineage you get the first of those war games that are then recreating old battles for people to later appreciate. And then you go directly from that to the military saying, hey, this was a really good idea 100 years ago. We should start doing it again. All right, so in the United States, tabletop games kick off with wargaming after World War II. We were just talking about that a little bit, right? This good idea, there's a guy named H.G. Wells, you probably have heard of, who created a game called Little Wars because he had a collection of 10 soldiers and he really liked them and he wanted to play with them. A natural impulse for anyone with a collection of soldiers. So his game is silly. It's a very silly game. You get a little catapult and you put it on top of your soldier and you shoot the other guy's soldier and you take turns until no one has any soldiers left. That's basically the game, right? From there, people start adding dice, start adding more rules, start adding maybe, you know, Let's get rid of the guy who's like the referee who says whether or not you can do that. Let's make it games that we can just play with each other. That's in the US. Meanwhile, across the pond in Germany, the Germans post-war do not want to play games about war anymore because they did not win the war. So this is not fun. So they start making games about farming, right? They make games about agriculture, about industry, about building things. So right there from the middle of the 20th century, you have two divided lines of game development in board games. You have, let's make games about simulating things. Let's make games about fighting a war. And you have, let's make games that maybe aren't as detailed, but they're games about family life. They're games that a group of people are more interested in playing together rather than adversarially. All right, 
these two groups of people continue playing games pretty much never talking to each other for 50 years. Then you get to a wonderful time called the 1980s and everyone wears neon clothing as you all know from um, everything now which is influenced by the 80s. But in the US we've had this boom of role-playing games. So war games were cool, war games were cool and then they were like, well, let's get, let's get into this acting element a little bit more. So Dungeons and Dragons comes along. People call that the first role-playing game. That's an arguable term, but it's useful enough. D&D becomes a phenomenon. By the early 80s, D&D is the game to play. It is extremely cool. They're selling it in every toy store in the mall. And people are buying it for their kids for Christmas, which, you know, isn't that unfamiliar if you grew up with the video game console boom, if you grew up with the NES, if you grew up with even like later the PS1 or the Xbox, these were hot gifts. Everyone wanted to give them to people, right? D&D was like that. Except when video games started being cool, D&D took a hard dive. By the early 90s, war games and D&D were the only board games really thriving in the US and they were going downhill fast. They weren't doing well anymore. But the Germans, meanwhile, they had made games that weren't so niche. They had made games that a wider variety of people were interested in playing. And it kept the board game hobby alive through the digital revolution in their country. So about 1995, you have this game come along called The Settlers of Catan by this guy called Klaus Teuber. And Klaus is like, this seems fun. I'd like to make a game about Iceland. I've always thought Iceland was interesting. And everyone else says, maybe don't make it about Iceland. No one thinks that's interesting but you. Maybe make it about something fictional. <laughs> so he makes up a land called Catan, and the people go there, and they settle it. And you've all heard of this game, because it goes on to sell 27 million copies around the world. It goes on to become, unarguably, the most successful modern board game there is. So from 1995 to the early 2000s, you have this hilarious trend where there are all these cool, weird board games coming out in Germany that no one in the US knows how to play. So on this weird place, it's brand new, you may not have heard of it, it's called the internet. These guys who lived in Germany, they were usually serving there, ironically, in the army, will translate these games and they post the rules online and they offer to ship a copy to anyone who sends them some money, right? So they send someone a copy of Catan. They send someone a copy of Würfel Bonanza. All kinds of silly German games. But they really start to catch on. They go to all these little conventions around the US. People start playing them more and more. And then slowly but surely, tabletop game design starts coming back. And then you fast forward to today right? Where tabletop games are nuts. Like, I do this for a living and I'm continually surprised by the statistics. Okay, Gen Con. It's a big convention in Indianapolis every year. It's the largest tabletop game convention in the world. 200,000 or more people show up to this convention every single year. This year, 600 new board games released at Gen Con. 600. As in, you could play a new board game every day of the year that had come out at only Gen Con and you wouldn't play them all. This year, 4,000 new tabletop product SKUs have been registered. So that's the, like the barcode, right? Yeah, sure. Some of those are dice. Some of them are the Walking Dead Monopoly 3. But a lot of those are other games. And a lot of those are games from now around the world, increasingly more and more. Um, UK Games Expo in 2007, it's a tabletop game convention in the UK, right? It had slowly grown a few percentage points year over year. It had 1,700 people. Today, 10 years later, it has 31,000 attendees, right? Dungeons and Dragons, that little game that was like so successful and a huge craze in the 80s had its most successful year ever last year, as in better than the whole decade of the 1980s. They sold more books for their game last year than 
for a decade when it was really cool. So cool that it sparked a weird mom panic where everyone was like, D&D will make my kids evil. Yeah, they're selling a lot of books now. <laughs> Even the niche genres, war games and miniatures games, which puttered along just fine, right? Warhammer did okay. They sold a lot of figures, they did all right. They're seeing upticks again. They're selling more figures than ever. These games that it was really hard to find someone to play with for a long time are now suddenly very cool again. Why? Like, how, how did that happen? How do we go from a percentage increase that's something like seven or 800% for some of these publishers? They're literally publishing 10 times as many games as they were two decades ago. Mostly, it's the internet. Specifically, it's crowdfunding. Because two decades ago, if you wanted to make a game, you had to first decide that it was a good enough game, find enough people to play it. Maybe you could find a game convention. Maybe you were lucky enough to live in a city like Indianapolis that had a game convention with like 2,000 people. That was really big. Maybe you could show it to 2,000 people. Maybe you could convince enough of them that they liked it. Then the next year, you could maybe sell it if you could scrape together 20,000 bucks for a print run of the game, you're gonna print, I don't know, five, 6,000 copies of the game and hope you can sell them all? That was a big ask. You had no idea. I mean, I, mean, I, I can barely get together like rent money every month. Think about saying, this is what I'm gonna stake my life on. And people did, and some succeeded. You have games like Steve Jackson Games' Munchkin, right? It's a little known story that that was kind of make or break for that company. They either were gonna make it or they weren't. If that game didn't succeed, it was over. No more games. It worked. Now they have a huge company. But that was luck. For every success story like that from the late 80s and early 90s, there are 10 other companies that didn't make it. But now, you have crowdfunding. You can go directly online. You can say, hey, does anybody like this game? If so, give me $60, and in a year and a half, you'll have a copy. And if a 1,000 people think that's a good idea, they do it. And suddenly, you have games. Suddenly, you have 4,000 new games a year. Because that internet enabled, like that direct marketing, where they could look you in the eye digitally and say, this game is a good idea, and I like it. Here's the rules. Here's a look at it. That changed the physical product of board games so much. Because as that developed, at the same time in China, they had a massive industrialization boom where they are able to make 60 or 70,000 injection molded miniatures for you in a month and put them in boxes with components and rules and ship them over here and you can sell them if you can scrape together that upfront money, which conveniently is now coming from crowdfunding, right? So, there are lots of games now. But John, you say to me, doesn't that mean some of the games suck? And I will say, boy does it ever. <laughs> some of the games are very bad. Sort of astoundingly so, in fact. But at the same time, that's kind of good, right? If we look at that pattern with, say, video games, right? If you're a PC gamer, you know Steam, and you know what Steam has become in the last decade and a half, which is it has become an absolute monstrosity stuffed with games, with something like a thousand new things posted every month. That's kind of good. It means anybody can make a game and get it out there. And if we're being really honest with ourselves, we're kind of lucky that tabletop games has the quality control thing where you have to crowdfund it and find a couple hundred people who really want to play your game first before you really can get it going, if that makes sense. That said, what happens when you have a really successful board game? You make it, you sell it, maybe you make another? Maybe you make some expansions. Now, you, this is the person who knows. Expansions, right? You get these games, 
start making games, start making expansions for your games. Then you've developed a whole universe for your game. You've developed an elaborate IP, right? And you can turn that IP into more games that are related. And then maybe you talk to a video game developer and they think it's a good idea to also make a video game or translate your first board game into a video game adaptation. And increasingly, that's what you're seeing. We're starting to see board games go digital. And the question is, is that going to be successful? That still remains to be seen. There's been a huge boom this year alone of digital adaptations of board games. We're seeing a lot of mobile ones. They're good. They're on tablets. It's naturally suited to the sort of pick up the physicality of a board game. But now we're starting to see big adaptations for board games. We've got the normal. We've got Catan. You can play Catan in VR now, if, if the passion so takes you to do that. But beyond that, right, last year's big board game success story is a game called Gloomhaven. Have any of you heard of Gloomhaven? A couple of you? OK. So Gloomhaven is a dungeon crawling board game with a big story, right? So you go from game to game. And as you play more sessions of Gloomhaven, it unfolds like a, role of a digital or video role playing game, right? The choices you make in previous plays of the game affect later plays of the game. You lay out new dungeons, and you go through those. You buy new equipment, and you unlock new characters, and you change stories, and you permanently alter the game. And your character dies, and literally, you tear up the card, and you throw the character away, and they're dead. Your, your character's dead now. That is maybe the biggest thing that's happened in board games in the last few years. Legacy games. Legacy games are intense. This, and, and the funny thing is, I tell this to video gamers all the time, I'm like, legacy games are huge, and you're gonna start seeing legacy game elements in your video games. And they're like, I don't know what that means. I don't understand you. I'm serious. It's coming for you, and it's coming soon. Legacy games. The whole con conceit here is that each time you play the game, it changes how the game plays, which seems very simple. You say, my video game already does that. When I play Skyrim, it's different the next time because I killed the guy or I got very annoyed at my companion and I left them to die. Yes, that's true. Legacy games, however, started with a game called Risk. We all know Risk. We probably love to hate Risk or we maybe also just hate Risk, right? A guy named Rob Daviau, who was working at Hasbro, convinced the other people at Hasbro to, let, Hasbro to let him do a crazy thing. He was like, I want to make a game of Risk that changes every time you play it. You do stuff. Risk Legacy is this crazy mishmash, far future Earth setting. And it's Risk. It's recognizable. You roll dice. You fight the other person. You move on. It's got some streamlining. So instead of taking you know, 5 to 12 hours, it takes about 60 minutes which is nice. But Risk, Risk Legacy has all this cool stuff. It has nuclear weapons. This is a great example. If you use a nuke in Risk Legacy, you've got a little token, you use the nuke, you toss that token in the box, and then you take a big sticker and you sweep it across an entire section of the map. Permanently on that board, there's a sticker there. That means somebody nuked it. It's now radioactive forever. You just sweep aside all those units. It's over, right? You conquer a continent in Risk Legacy, you get to name it, right? You're like, no, it's not Australia anymore. It's John Australia, right? You do that. And it's very much that element that I think you're going to start to see in video games in the coming years. And I say this because Gloomhaven is a legacy game. I was just talking about Gloomhaven. They're making a Gloomhaven video game. They're not changing much. They think you're going to like it. I think you're going to start to see your video game developers go for this too. They're going to have it set up so that when you play your game, it changes, right? You make a choice, it's permanent unless you uninstall and reinstall that game, right? Unless you effectively rebuy it, give up all your progress, you're going to see these permanent changes come into games. It's a big element and it's hugely successful. A game called Pandemic. It's a cooperative disease fighting board game where you're some cool researchers and you fly around the world and you stop everyone from dying of toxoplasmosis or whatever it is, okay? They made a legacy version of this game with a story you play through month to month. It was so successful that they've made a second one, a season two. It's literally called season two. It's a second story, right? 
That was so successful that they are now making season three. In fact, Pandemic Legacy season two was so successful that the Germans, we love the Germans, they saved board games. Remember this from earlier? Okay. They have a very prestigious award called the Spiel des Jahres, which is the game of the year. They give out three of them. One for the nerd game, one for the family game, and one for the kids game. They liked Pandemic Legacy Season 2 so much, they made up a fourth award that they've only given out a handful of times before and gave it to that, right? It's pretty huge. This kind of success is rare in tabletop games. Okay, so I keep going on. I keep saying this to you. I think you're going to see it in your video games. I think you're going to see it in your video games. Why do I think that? Because the people who make your video games fucking love board games. They love them. The biggest consumer of board games in the world right now? The Port of San Francisco. Games go in there as though they were being shipped to other places. Far fewer games come out. Because they just go right down the road to Silicon Valley. They go to game developers. In fact, in the late 80s and early 90s, when it became clear that the money was going to move to video games, a lot of the old school role playing and board game developers went to video games. Nowadays, they're coming back to board games. People like um, a guy named Sandy Peterson, who made a game you may have heard of called Call of Cthulhu, he went over to video games. He made Age of Mythology, he worked for years at Microsoft. Recently, he checked out. He was like, thanks, I'm done with video games. I'm gonna go make board games again. And since then he's had multiple million dollar Kickstarters. And in all his years in video games, he mentored the people who are making video games now. He showed them these old board games. He showed them new board games. He showed them modern board games. All those designers who worked in video games for years shared that love with the younger generation. And you're starting to see those elements grow up and you're starting to see references, even in things like TV shows, right? Like if you go watch a lot of the Netflix originals, um, a really good example is Orphan Black. Have you ever, any of you ever seen Orphan Black? Yes. It's a great show about clones. Yes. In like, I want to say 50% of the off, chill, downtime scenes in Orphan Black, they're playing board games. And they're not playing Monopoly, they're playing modern board games. On their shelves in the background, there's board games, right? This is like a cultural insurgency, and it's fueled by crowdfunding. It's fueled by the popularity of these modern games and the skill with which they're designed. Okay, so the other things I think you're going to see soon. Tough cooperative games with hard choices. We were just talking about Pandemic. Those are coming to video games. There's not a lot of them right now, but they're on the way. Right now, video games, co-op, right? You think of co-op, you think of like Left 4 Dead. You think of Overcooked, right? They're sort of like frantic, frenzied games. They're about speed and communication. I think you're going to see, start to see more and more games like Pandemic, like Gloomhaven, that are about measured, thoughtful, cooperative play. That board game experience, which is very social, it's very much about talking with your friends while you're playing, about having conversations, that's going to move more and more into video games. Cool. Okay, but I've talked a lot about board games. What about card games? Does anybody play Hearthstone? Every once in a while, I see somebody nodding. Why is Hearthstone so successful? Does anybody know? Because Blizzard, that, that's actually a very good reason. I have a slightly different theory. It's building off of 20 years of Magic the Gathering development. The guys who make Magic for 20 something years have been figuring out exactly what works when you make a card game. The guys at Blizzard were like, hey, that's a pretty good idea. What if we made it so that everyone could figure out how to play? which turned out to be very successful. Um, that said, the newest incarnation of Magic that's going digital, it's called Magic the Gathering Arena, they had a million people sign up for their beta. Closed beta, not like, oh, I'm just gonna try, check this out, like, I desperately would like to try this, and I'm gonna put in a bunch of personal information so that I can do that. It's like a two-page form, and you know what the drop-off is as soon as there's two pages, right? It's like 100%, no one wants to do two pages. I personally don't wanna do two pages. All right, so magic, streaming. Streaming, a little bit, has blown magic up. Regions where it used to be unsuccessful, like Korea and Japan, it did okay, it did pretty good. It's huge now. Because the game is so much more accessible, because you can watch people play it, 
which sort of directly leads into the next topic. Earlier we were talking about Dungeons and Dragons, right? D&D is huge again. We were saying it's had its best year ever, right? Why? D&D doesn't need anything to be successful. You need like some books, right? And yeah, it can be kind of expensive, but if you get a group of five people, you can scrape together $100, $150, and you can play D&D. Also, they have free rules, right? The hard thing was always figuring out how to play the game. If you didn't have someone to teach you how to play a role-playing game, it was really hard. Role-playing games are complex, they're social, they require planning, they require forethought. Someone has to schedule it, someone has to make the game to a certain degree, right? A dungeon master is a game designer, they put together a game for you to play. But, suddenly, streaming, Twitch. You can just go on Twitch. You can watch some people play D&D. If you've never had anyone to explain it, if no one else in your town, no one in your neighborhood, no one in your school plays D&D, you could go online and watch. You jump online. You watch a few hours of shows like Critical Role or Misclicks. These are online streaming troops. If, if, have any of you seen people play D&D online, seen streaming shows? Right, so this may seem strange, but it may not. If you've ever watched like streamed video games, you understand exactly what this is. You just watch people play the game. It's dynamic, it's interesting, and it explains the concepts to you. So now suddenly role-playing games are easier to get into than ever. Suddenly Dungeons and Dragons is cool again. Again, cool again, again. Right. Okay, you're still with me, right? Okay. Not just Dungeons and Dragons, though. There's hundreds of other role-playing games you may not have heard of. One of them is getting made into what might be one of the biggest budget, biggest interest video games in the coming few years. If you've seen a lot of trailers for a game called Cyberpunk 2077, yes, you've seen these? Do you know that's based off a role-playing game from 1980? Okay, good, I'm glad we all know that. <laughs> Cyberpunk 2020 is hysterical. It's ridiculously dated. You physically plug your modem into things to hack them. <laughs> okay, you carry around a keyboard with you? I don't know. Look, when the Berlin Wall fell, things from the West started flooding into countries like Poland, and some guys who would later go on to found a video game company called CD Projekt Red got their hands on some Cyberpunk 2020 role-playing games, and it blew their mind. They had no idea how to play them. They barely spoke English. But they learned more, and they liked it, and they kept playing it, and now, 30 years later, maybe they're going to make a huge video game about it. The people who make that game, the guy who designed it, Mike Pondsmith, you've probably seen him if you've watched any of the Cyberpunk 2077 uh, promotional materials. He's like a big, huge guy with a really deep voice. He just sort of sat on that, right? Like, he made that a long time ago, and he didn't think anything was ever going to come of it until he got a call out of the blue. One of the reasons that's true now is because role-playing games are cool again. He's been selling copies of his 30-year-old game that he hasn't really moved a lot of in years. Actually, to the point where he had to reprint it, which is kind of amazing for small-time role-playing games. Okay, beyond that, there's a lot of things going on in indie role-playing. Role-playing games, big ones, Dungeons and Dragons, they're about really accessible themes. If you guys think indie games do weird stuff, if you think like indie video games are cool and strange and emotional, if that's something that interests you, those weird themes, very intensely personal games, I have got some crazy things to tell you about as far as indie tabletop games go. It gets, it gets weird fast, but I'm not going to go too deep into it, but games like Fiasco, games like Apocalypse World, um, and beyond, games like Dread, they are games that explore basic themes, but they do them in very mature ways. They are interested in talking about things like sexuality, like intense emotion, dealing with and going through big issues. There's a game called Carry. It's a game about war, but it's a game about soldiers in war. It's not a game about fighting. It's a game about dealing with the things the characters are processing. And the players around the table are those soldiers. The players around the table are talking about what they deal with day to day 
they're games that have intense possibility for emotional transformation. They have an intense possibility to make you feel like you're there, to help you understand people who are radically different than you. Here's a good one. There's a board game coming out. I think it's in the next six to eight months. It's called Holding On, The Troubled Life of Billy Carr. Maybe not the best title, but it's a fascinating game. It's a board game, but it's taking lessons from these indie role-playing games. It's telling you a story. The players are playing a very straightforward board game, right? You manage some resources. It's economic. You, the players, are nurses and doctors in a home for the dying. Very thrilling. Kind of depressing. You get a patient whose name is Billy Carr who has a mystery background. No one really knows who he is. The game is about living the day-to-day -day life of these people as they work in this place, doing their jobs, making sure that bedpans are changed and patients are seen to. While they're doing that, they are trying to figure out who this man is. So as you find the time in your day, someone stops by and talks to him. You find out a little bit about who he is, the life he lived. What brought him to this point where he is alone and sick and dying? But you're doing this with your friends. You're doing this around a table. And I think that is the key thing about modern tabletop games. That is what brings you there every week or every month or whenever you can get some people together to play with your friends is in an increasingly disconnected world, they're doing more than ever to find ways using the game to make us feel connected to each other, to make us feel together. And that, I think, is why I wanted to talk to you about this today. Because if you're not playing these games, they will make your life better. They won't just make your life better, they'll make your friends' lives better. They will encourage you to spend time with the people you didn't realize you weren't spending time with. And for that, for just hearing me say that, I thank you for coming out here today. I really appreciate it.